what, what we want to uh, present today is something that I think is uh, really a very exciting intellectual endeavor. Uh, and it's one in which UCSD has had a lot of involvement uh, in various different ways. So I was on the uh, initial organizing board that uh, put together the set of studies that we're going to talk about today. Uh, Gareth has been extremely heavily involved in the later stages of the project, including having done a postdoc. Uh, with EGAP, and then Claire was one of the principal investigators on one of the individual studies. So we have kind of three very different uh, points of, of contact uh, to these projects, and uh, and I wanted to try to put together a panel where we can kind of speak from these different perspectives. So we will welcome any questions that you have throughout the presentation, so, so no need to hold questions to the end. So, uh, so what I'd like to do is just start by kind of motivating uh, where this idea came from and why we think this is a very important advance in the way that social science research is done. So what I want to begin with is essentially the kind of crisis of confidence in, in social science research that has emerged uh, over the course of the last few years. This is a crisis that has affected uh, different disciplines with different degrees of severity. I think uh, psychology is the one where I've been the, the kind of deepest questions about, you know, are the core results in the, in the discipline reliable or not? But all of this has led to a climate where I think academics are stepping back and asking ourselves, you know, what can we do to make our research more replicable? replicable? What can we do to make it more reliable? And then furthermore, when one is engaged in lots of conversations with policymakers, you know, the core question that you always have from a policymaker is like, okay, fine, I believe you that your study worked in context X, but I'm not interested in context X. I want to, I want to apply it in context Y, and will it work there? That is, of course, an extremely difficult question to answer, and if one is going to have any hope of answering that, you have to be able to think about generating evidence across a bunch of different sites in order to be able to aggregate this up. So what we'll be talking about today is the first of the so-called metacatives, which is from EGAP, which is a group of uh, highly quantitative, experimental, mostly political scientists. Uh, it's experiments in governance and politics. Um, and it's a consortium that have been trying to kind of advance the use of randomized control trials in political science in particular. So uh, EGAP put together what it is called the metacatives. Uh, Metacata is a vast word that means what? I always forget what Accumulation, okay, so Medicaid is a vast word that means accumulation, and so the idea is that this is a really somewhat fundamentally new approach to how to accumulate and aggregate evidence in social science. So let me kind of go through the steps that have, have built up to where this is, and then I'll, I'll turn over to Gareth for a presentation of the overall results, and then to Claire for a talk about her own study that she ran as a part of this consortium, and, and maybe a little bit of uh, contemplation about what some of the tensions are in terms of working as an investigator in this kind of consortium, because that's kind of part, part and parcel of what we're, what we're trying to think through. So the first issue that I want to put on the table is publication bias, right? So there's a very well-known push in academic journals uh, to publish sexy and significant and impactful results. And there's a general sense that a non-result is nothing, and it's not a story, it's not worthy of publication. So there's a very well-established uh, problem in uh, the meta-analysis literature that you tend to be missing the insignificant results from the literature because they just get put in the file drawer and people don't uh, follow them up. There's also a lot of conversation around the issue of p-hacking, right? That if you draw the density curve of the level of significance of published academic results, you get this huge spike right at 5%, which is the, the conventional level. So there's a general sense that the academic literature is not reflecting well the full set of results that the studies that we start uh, uh, generate, and, and that's incredibly important. Now, a related concern here is that people are going out and running studies that have a very large number of outcomes that are measured as a part of the study, and it then makes it very easy to just kind of trawl through the outcomes and report only the things that were interesting and significant and worked, and that presents a very distorted picture of the results of the study, and it also means that kind of normal statistics don't work the way they should. So these two features have, have resulted in a very strong push in the last few years in experimental social science for pre-registration of trials. So that pre-registration serves two very different purposes. One of them is it lets someone who's coming along and trying to do a meta-study observe the whole universe of studies that have been conducted 
on that topic. And the second one is it lets you say in advance, these are the primary outcomes of the study, these are the things that I'm going to look at, and so take these outcomes seriously. So this is kind of the first pair of things that, that we see really shaping up to be important. Um, and, and then along with this comes the fact that you know, the replic replicability of research in social sciences is not where it should be. So it is not the norm that you post all of your raw data, all of the data cleaning files that go from raw data to clean data, all of the tables that generate the final output. If we're doing any replication, it's really just the final data set and the final tables, and we need to be doing much better than that. So all of this is kind of a part of the general push towards research transparency, uh, which is something that the, the Policy Design Evaluation Lab has been in investing in trying to push forward at UCSD. Now a different set of problems come down to this issue of, you know, if a study worked in context A, will it work in context B? So uh, what we would like to do in order to understand this well is to combine the ultimate tool for internal validity, which is the randomized controlled trial, right? universally used in medicine and now increasingly used in, 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 in social science as well, we would like to be able to run randomized controlled trials because they are internally valid. They give you the right answer for that sample, but we would like to be able to run RCTs across many different sites and to be able to put together a kind of a meta distribution of what the results from these independent RCTs are when done in many different places. Okay. So kind of the preeminent example of this in the economics literature is the so-called targeting the ultra-poor program from BRAC. And so this is a very well-known intervention. It's been tried in a lot of places. And so IPA went out and raised several million dollars and then ran a six-country study where they did exactly the same intervention with exactly the same implementer in six different countries, got very similar results in all six countries. And that really helps to bolster your confidence, like this intervention is going to work everywhere with this type of person. So this is a great way of going, but the problem is that it's kind of like the academics equivalent of a command and control economy, right? That it's, it's basically someone coming in and saying, this is the intervention that we need to know about, and so we're going to you know, put millions, literally millions of dollars behind replicating exactly the same thing everywhere. So what if you were wrong? What if there was a very similar adjacent intervention that would have worked, but because you did exactly the same thing everywhere, you never learned that, right? So the normal process of funding academic research in almost every discipline is a little bit more along the kind of let a thousand flowers bloom dimension, which is you have open RFPs, and then you let the research community tell you what's interesting, right? They come up with the ideas, they submit the proposals, and you fund the best ones. So how do you balance these things against each other, and how do you further balance the fact that you know, academics has enormous rewards for being the first and very few rewards for replicating, right? So society really needs replication. That's where we learn what actually works everywhere. And academia doesn't generate replication very well, right? So try to keep in mind all of these tensions. What you want to come up with is a system that features pre-registration and replicability of results. And then you want to try to balance, in some sense, this let a thousand flowers bloom approach of having investigators come to you with the ideas that they think are interesting and the interventions that they think are going to work with this principle of doing coordinated research that measures things in a consistent way. So what the Medicata approach is, and this, this has now been replicated, there are now three new Medicatas that are moving forward. Three new ones, right? There's four total. So, so in addition to the one that we are presenting here, there are now three new Medicatas on three different topics that EGAP is moving forward. This was the first one, and this is the one that is complete. So just very quickly, uh, the way that we set this process up, which was trying to kind of balance these competing ends, is as follows. First, we had an open expression of interest to the academic community. Send us you know, a two-page document saying, what do you think is interesting and what should we be working on? And then we use those EOIs to identify, here is where there's a huge density of researchers that want to work on one topic, and we can think about putting together a coordinated request for proposals there. Then we issued an RFP, which was still open and anyone could apply. Um, those applications came in, and from those then we selected a group of seven projects, each one of which was doing uh, voter education campaigns immediately before an election to try to understand how change in the information sets that voters have 
alters the extent to which they reward performance in their politicians, okay? So this was the question that we cohered around, and then we insisted that every study have one treatment arm that was as similar as they could possibly be in terms of providing voter information at the individual level, we asked studies to coordinate on outcome measurement so that we were as much as possible measuring outcomes and covariates in exactly the same way. We explicitly opened up the possibility that every study would be welcome to have a second arm in their RCT so they can study something else. And it's up to them what they want to study. So this was kind of our way of trying to achieve, and then, and then, sorry, and then as a part of participation, every single study had to pre-register their individual study. We pre-registered a meta-analysis. All studies have to have completely open access to data, and everything, as you will see, is now been put in this unbelievably beautiful transparent format that really lets you come in and tinker around with whatever assumptions you want and see how the answers would change, okay? So, um, so, so, so this is sort of a way of trying to, to combine these two goals. We let the research community tell us what they were interested in doing. Uh, we let all of the studies have an arm in which they could do whatever they want, but then we worked sort of after the fact to try to coordinate as closely as we, po as we possibly could to come up with something that looks like a single intervention with outcomes that are measured in a tightly harmonized way and with everyone being subject to this meta pre-analysis plan uh, that we put all of the studies through to try to come up with the overall result, okay? So since I was involved at the beginning, I wanted to take a few words to, to talk about kind of the genesis, how we designed this, what were the competing goals that we were trying to resolve, and then you'll hear much more detail from, from Gareth and Claire uh, how the process played out. So with no further ado, let me, let me introduce our two panelists. So uh, we have Gareth Nellis, uh, who's an assistant professor of political science here at UCSD. We're delighted to welcome him here. Uh, he's a specialist in comparative politics, political economy, and modern South Asia. Um, prior to coming to UCSD, he worked as the um, postdoctoral fellow for EGAP at Berkeley. Um, and then we have Claire Abita, who is Associate Professor of Political Science, also here at UCSD. Uh, most of her research is on uh, how to reduce outgroup discrimination uh, and the strategies that vulnerable minorities employ to navigate discriminatory environments. As you see, she will be talking about something quite different today, uh, so we're delighted to have both of them, and I hope you'll uh, join me in giving them a hand. Thank you everyone, it's uh, great to be here. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much to Vanessa and to Craig for setting this up. It's uh, great to have a chance to talk about this project, which both Claire and I have, have uh, invested an awful lot of time in, uh, and it's exciting to now be presenting the results to wide audiences. So, um, Uh, so as Craig mentioned, this was an initiative launched by EGAP, uh, Evidence in Governance and Politics. Um, uh, it was about, I think, a two, two and a half million dollar grant uh, to fund uh, seven projects originally uh, that would address uh, this issue of uh, the effect of providing voters with information uh, on their uh, uh, electoral behavior. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is the uh, subject of a forthcoming book with Cambridge University Press in the Studies in Comparative Politics series. Um, information Accountability and Cumulative Learning, so pick up your copy in August. Uh, this was the um, sort of the set of people involved in this initiative in various different ways. Uh, we jokingly refer to the sort of uh, upper echelon committee as the Politburo, uh, which Craig sat on, was chaired by uh, Thad Dunning from UC Berkeley. And then we had seven individual sub, uh, uh, study teams and another number of other key contributors as well who helped with the meta-analysis and the follow-up experiment uh, I'm going to be talking about a bit later on. So this was an initiative involving 31 people working uh, pretty intensively uh, on this. Um, so undertaking this kind of an endeavor uh, really is a, a big deal and involved a lot of sort of interpersonal coordination challenges uh, as well, which uh, we might talk about later. I want to just motivate the uh, topic, the substantive topic area that uh, this, these projects address, which is uh, the issue of information and accountability. And then, uh, then going to walk through just some of the uh, pillars uh, of the Medicator initiative, uh, some of which Craig touched upon. I'll then present the uh, study designs and the results. 
Uh, I then want to dwell for a little bit on uh, some of the tools, kind of the tool, new tools of the trade that we used to try and really make sure uh, this was as transparent and credible an initiative as possible. As we can see, this is a kind of a proof of concept of a new way of doing social science research, and I, I want to emphasize that. Then last, uh, if we have time, uh, I'm going to present just quickly uh, a follow-up experiment we did with policymakers to try and see whether presenting them with this type of research, this uh, collection of studies, multi-site studies, improves their abilities to make out-of-sample predictions, so a test of external validity, and whether it was more persuasive compared to conventional approaches to, uh, uh, to creating research. So the motivating questions uh, here are rather uh, simple ones, but also very topical ones. Why might citizens repeatedly vote for politicians who are corrupt and incompetent? We see that in many corners of the globe. And so, so to flip it around, why might citizens frequently fail to vote for clean politician, politicians who are highly competent? Why do they too often get kicked out of office? A very simple hypothesis which has existed, uh, at least going back to sort of the classical philosophers, is that information might be a really important part of this story. Uh, simply put, many parties suffer from severe information deficits in which it's very difficult to access reliable information on politicians' performance and attributes. And so if you don't know what they're up to, or you don't know who they really are, how could you hold them accountable for that? And behind this is the notion that democratic institutions can only really ensure accountable government if citizens are informed about the actions their representatives take. This simple hypothesis for why we see this sort of constant adverse selection into politics suggests a fairly simple remedial intervention. Let's assume that we have some objective information on, how, on who politicians are and how they behave. If we just provided that uh, information more directly to voters, hopefully they would update their behaviors, they would change their behaviors, and hopefully this would create uh, better selection and better incentives for the politicians that are in, that are in office. Now this simple story is obviously too simple. It belies you know, uh, uh, the reality, which is that there is a fairly complex causal chain connecting the existence of objective information to uh, better behavior by politicians in office, which is uh, basically the, the, you know, the end goal we have in mind here. First of all, we have to assume that it's possible to get reliable inf objective information on what politicians are up to. Some behaviors are so sort of uh, covert that that might be very difficult in many circumstances. We then have to assume that we have a mechanism for disseminating this information widely to voters, uh, and we can do it at scale. We then have to assume that having disseminated this, that the voters are able to receive it and sort of come into close contact with it. Then that they uh, take this information and they digest it and they update their beliefs on the basis of it. Then that those changed beliefs actually inform their behavior when it comes to voting in the ballot box. And then finally, that these uh, changing changes in their voting behavior actually translates into anything concrete in terms of politicians' performance in office. What we're gonna focus on today is everything really uh, up to the last link in this chain. We're going to see whether providing voters with better information uh, uh, actually causes them to change uh, their behaviors when it comes to thinking which candidates to vote for in real elections. Yeah. So if if information is important and voters value them, value information, think about the mature democracy. I would guess that the the the, the, the road to provide information was by radio programs or newspapers. Uh, and then, if you guys are filling some gap into providing information, then why why is there a gap initially? Yeah, so it's a good question. So we do have, you know, in many countries we have a vibrant and a free media which may be circulating some of this information. In other environments, however, there may be a media, but it may not be free and it may not be vibrant. It may be only circulating certain types of information. We may have state-controlled media which don't want to disseminate uh, damaging information about incumbents. Incumbents might control the airwaves in many contexts. So the places we'll be looking at, developing democracies, these kind of information constraints uh, seem like a, a real problem that this good, reliable information about what politicians are up to is just not circulating as freely as we would hope. Yeah. Sorry, just a quick follow-up to that. Like, do we have, uh, like, what does the literature say about like what, how this chain of causality works in places where there is really vibrant free media? Like, do we know, like, yeah, I don't know, is that what the ritual? Um, so there is a large, there is a literature uh, on media effects uh, in advanced democracies, and much of it does find an impact. For example, Fox News. 
uh, in uh, sort of uh, quasi-experimental designs has been shown to boost uh, vote shares for Republicans. Um, what we're going to be looking at is a sort of a different class of interventions, not uh, changing the media environment writ large, but redisseminating information just more directly, sort of right into voters' hands to see whether this direct contact with voters and information causes them to update their behavior even more so. But it's a good question. It definitely falls within this broader class of thinking about ways we could uh, think about informing citizens. Okay, so the evidence uh, on this topic, uh, and in uh, thinking about this particular class of inter interventions, is in some disarray. So there have been previous studies which have attempted to deliver good objective information about politicians' performance right into the hands of voters, and then to track how they uh, go on to uh, behave uh, when it comes to uh, casting their votes. Uh, but the evidence is, is, is really uh, quite confusing when seen uh, in the aggregate. So a study in Mexico finds that uh, providing voters with information about how corrupt their politicians are uh, causes them to uh, stay at home on election day. Another uh, study in Delhi uh, found that providing any information uh, increased turnouts and that it increased the number of votes going towards high-performing incumbents uh, when benchmarked against sort of objective measures. However, a very similar study to the Delhi one conducted in Uganda found a full slate of null results uh, for these report cards. So coming into this, I guess in 2013 or so, um, there was uh, some knowledge sort of scattered all over the place about what uh, impact these interventions might have, but very little general sense of what is the true effect of providing voters with better information. As Craig mentioned, that we've, uh, the last few years have seen a credibility revolution across the social and uh, the natural sciences as well. Uh, and this really has started to improve the reliability, uh, our, our confidence in, in claims made about causal effects. That said, we still live in a world, I think, where single high-impact studies receive disproportionate attention, uh, often on the, sort of the front pages of the New York Times. Standards of analysis and reporting are not what we would hope them to be. And the evidence that's generated is not packaged in a way that's useful for policy makers. And this has sort of been receiving increasing attention. There's a great sense that something needs to be done, but there still isn't a sort of a large enough number of people uh, doing it yet. This is what the Medicator Initiative is about. So Craig laid out the, um, the key sort of uh, parts of it, but it's a collaborative research uh, endeavor aimed at improving policy relevant knowledge accumulation using field experiments. Is there anyone who doesn't know what a field experiment is? We're all familiar with the, the language. Um, so multiple teams uh, implement parallel randomized control trials. Uh, there is a great deal of harmonization that takes place uh, in thinking about these RCTs um, beforehand. So the, the interventions or the treatments are harmonized to make them uh, relatively simple, uh, similar, similar to one another. And uh, all measurement is very carefully harmonized. And the end goal here is to be able to bundle these uh, studies together in a meta-analysis, in a convincing meta-analysis, and to make it easy to analyze them jointly. There's a commitment to integrated publication. Um, so the phrase we use is, no credible study is left behind. So even if the results don't turn out the, ways, the way in which the authors expect, expected them to, we still have a full write-up, uh, and the, the wider sort of community of interested parties gets, gets to know what happened in this study. Lots of these things have been done uh, individually before. We do have examples of multi-site studies. But here we're trying to do sort of the very best possible, uh, given all the things, uh, all the advances that have been made over the last few years. I'm just going to talk through uh, some of these. Here we just itemize what we think are the same challenges uh, for cumulative learning uh, in sort of uh, conventional approaches to conducting research. And on the right hand side, we just uh, list the ways in which we think the Medicator, Medicator Initiative uh, can answer some of these challenges. And uh, to pick out sort of uh, some of the ones that I'm going to focus on, uh, down here towards set through 1710, we have this problem of private data that it's often very hard to access the raw files which went into creating analyses. We're going to make sure that all open data and replication code is freely available on GitHub and there's a full record kept of everything that was done. We can see that there are many, many uh, prominent studies which have been subsequently and embarrassingly overturned because of errors uh, in data and code. We answer this challenge with by having third parties replicate all studies. We have the problem of phishing, which uh, uh, has this uh, revolves around having uh, many, many outcome measures, selecting only uh, those to report which turn out to be significant. Here we're going to have pre-analysis plans with limited number of, of pre-specified hypotheses. And then publication bias, as we've mentioned, we're going to commit to publishing all registered uh, analyses uh, beforehand. 
So in this first iteration of uh, the Medicator idea, uh, we set out, or the committee set out, to have seven studies uh, dispersed across the global south. So these are going to be occurring in developing countries, uh, middle, in, mid, middle income countries for the most part, um, in uh, Latin America, Africa, and uh, one in Asia too, uh, but we'll see the one in India didn't uh, ultimately pan out. The goal was to provide objective information to voters about local, the performance of local incumbent politicians. So imagine you're a voter. An election is going to come up in the next one to two months. We're going to, you're going to have someone uh, come to you and deliver some information about how well the incumbent politician, the sitting politician, has performed in office or how corrupt uh, he or she might be, uh, and with the intent of uh, having it influence potentially your, your vote choice in the forthcoming election. The targets, the politicians who were targeted um, by these interventions, in, interventions differed in terms of their levels. Uh, so in Benin, uh, we had members of the National Assembly. In India, we had members of the Provincial Assemblies, uh, all the way down in Burkina Faso to think about municipal councillors, so the, the most local um, politicians uh, you would come into day-to-day uh, -day contact with. Now, the content of this information, uh, the content of these interventions, the kinds of information delivered did vary somewhat across uh, settings, but it can be thought of in three uh, distinct bundles. So in Uganda, we had two Uganda studies. In one of the Uganda studies, uh, the information delivered was about the policy positions of the incumbent, pol uh, the incumbent politicians, so how much they cared about different types of inf infrastructural uh, uh, priorities uh, and so forth. Um, there were many dimensions considered. In Brazil, Mexico, Uganda too, and India, the focus was on malfeasance. So it could have been, uh, in Brazil, it was the case that municipalities would have their accounts accepted or rejected by an independent national audit office, uh, and we delivered information about, uh, about that. Uh, in India, it was about whether or not the sitting uh, politician had a criminal record. And then in Benin and Burkina Faso, the focus was on uh, essentially public goods provision uh, how, is your, how has your area fared compared to uh, the regional average over the course of the incumbent's uh, term? The way in which we disseminated this uh, information also varied somewhat across studies. Uh, in a couple of cases, uh, videos were made. So in places where there's higher literacy, uh, it was believed that videos would be the most effective way to communicate this. Uh, and so canvases would go to the door with a video and have people watch a tablet explaining uh, what their incumbent had been up to. In other places, uh, flyers were put through mailboxes, sometimes repeated times. In Uganda 2 case, uh, people were sort of bombarded with SMS messages uh, explaining uh, what the local accounts looked like. And in other places, these were uh, conversations had one-on-one -on -one with uh, individual voters. Here are some examples of what the information looked like. So this is from the uh, Benin study that uh, Claire was on, uh, where you'll see that um, this is a uh, so an index of the performance uh, of the um, locality, um, considering a bundle of, uh, of public goods. Uh, this is uh, the average of, sort of on some kind of index for your incumbent, your deputy. Uh, this is the, de the departmental average, the sort of regional average. This is the national average. It's marked in red, which is a sign that your incumbent is underperforming compared to these other averages. Uh, this was an example from uh, Mexico, where information was provided um, about both public goods and corruption. Uh, this is from Brazil, where it was about municipal uh, audits um, uh, and the sort of judgment that had been cast on. There were two main outcomes that uh, were co uh, coordinated beforehand, uh, and which are the focus of the analysis. One is uh, a simply simple uh, dichotomous variable for whether or not that voter reported having voted for the incumbents in the election which had just happened. So after the election took place, there was an end line taken, people were asked, who did you vote for and did you vote? And this is coded as one if they voted for the incumbent, uh, uh, the person who was the incumbent before the election, and zero otherwise. There is a secondary outcome, which is whether or not they turned out to vote. And then we also record various intermediate outcomes, uh, looking at beliefs about politicians' honesty and politicians' efforts. And these are together some of these uh, intermediate parts of the causal chain to try and evaluate whether people did in fact update their beliefs, not uh, uh, leading them to uh, behavioral change. Now, if you sort of step back and think about this for a second, you'll re realize that there's a bit of a complication uh, in this whole story. To receive information is one thing, but what should you do with that information? How is it likely to inform your vote choice? 
Well, presumably that's going to depend on what the information is and how uh, it, it, you feel about it compared to what you previously believed. So we're going to think about information in, uh, uh, coming in two varieties. One variety is good news, and this is where the information that you receive is better than what you believed previously about your incumbent. Let's say you're, you believe that your incumbent was really corrupt, then you receive a reliable piece of information saying, actually, no, they're pretty honest. You update positively, presumably, and we count that as a, a, good, a piece of good news information. Conversely, uh, bad news information is where uh, receipt of information causes you to update negatively uh, to make you believe that your politicians are actually worse uh, than you believed beforehand. What we needed then to make this analysis work was, was pretty good data on uh, individual voters' priors, prior beliefs about their incumbent politicians. So there was a large baseline survey taken in which these priors were elicited. The information, uh, usually on a scale, say, of one to five, the information that was then delivered on the same scale, so you know, how corrupt is your politician on scale one to five, and then just by differencing those uh, two, the information from the priors, we can see whether this was good news for the individual uh, voter or bad news for the voter. And then we're going to conduct two subgroup analyses looking at the information uh, across these two subgroups. OK, um, let's, uh, I don't think we've uh, given away the game. Does anyone have any uh, thoughts about what the results might be? Uh, I flashed it up, hopefully it was too quick. Who, thought, who would think that the uh, delivering information in this manner would have changed how people vote? One. <laughs> okay, maybe the other sort of slides. Who thinks it wouldn't change for how people vote? Okay. Uh, you turned out to be correct. Uh, the, uh, the end result of this uh, very large effort was uh, a pretty precisely estimated null effect. Uh, providing voters uh, with information about the performance uh, of their local politicians uh, doesn't seem to have impact, uh, impacted how they voted uh, in that election. Now this turns out to be true both in the meta-analytic result, which is uh, the top um, uh, result here. Uh, so this is the good news, the effects on vote choice, and the effect of bad news on vote choice across these two subgroups. Uh, strikingly, it also turns out to be true in every individual study. In no study do we reject the null hypothesis uh, of, uh, of no significant effect. So um, this is uh, rather dispiriting uh, that uh, we went to this great effort testing a hypothesis which seems a proposition which seems sort of the logic which seems so simple, a base, yet which uh, doesn't seem to pan out uh, in practice. Sorry, can you remind me how you measured vote choice? Like, did you actually get to observe? What they voted, or no? So the vote, the, the vote choice measures I'm presenting here are based on self-reported vote choice uh, in an end line uh, taken, uh, I think, two to three, well, not more than two to three weeks after the election occurred. In some of the studies, there was also a cluster randomized aspect to it, in which they were able to observe precinct level um, uh, voting effects so using administrative data. Um, uh, those, uh, so how those results compare uh, is discussed quite extensively in the book. Um, that said, we think there are fairly good reasons to believe that these measures are reliable. Uh, in those studies where a random sample of voters was taken, we see that the distribution of vote choices matches actually quite closely the distribution in the precinct uh, as, a whole, as a whole. So there's, I think there's some, uh, some, some, fairly good uh, some fairly good evidence that this is a, these are reasonable measures. So what we see then, a summary of the sort of results of this, a very tightly estimated uh, null overall. Uh, it turns out there's really not a lot of heterogeneity. So you might think that maybe this effect is larger for people who don't have strong partisan attachments. Or maybe it's larger for people who are not co-ethnics of their local politician. Or maybe it's larger for those who are more trusting of the source of the information. Uh, none of those pre-registered hypotheses turns out to be the case. Uh, there really is very little going on uh, inside the data. Uh, one thing to mention is that uh, there were originally seven studies uh, planned, uh, but only six that were ultimately analyzed, six which produced data. Uh, one in India didn't occur um, because of ethical concerns uh, following um, uh, maltreatment of an, enumer an enumerator by, uh, I think, a relative or an associate of one of the politicians about whom inform information was being delivered. <laughs> so that, uh, that study got cancelled uh, midway through. However, we do conduct an, uh, sort of an analysis in which we ask how big would that India result needed to have been to overturn our, uh, our, sort of our estimate of the null overall effect. It turns out it would have had to have been absolutely enormous. So we're not really concerned uh, that, India having, uh, that India would have changed things had it been completed. 
So when we confront, confront null results like this, uh, it's always challenging. Uh, why did the null occur? Why did uh, nothing happen? Uh, we don't have uh, fantastic evidence, I will say, but we sort of do uh, land on what we think are the most likely candidate explanations. So two sort of main possibilities are that information uh, was not absorbed and therefore it failed to change the beliefs of voters. Another possibility is that information did change the beliefs, but because of other considerations that voters have, they chose not to act on those changed beliefs. It ultimately, it turns out we think that uh, the first of these stories uh, is the most likely uh, to have occurred. Um, we see uh, in our uh, estimations uh, of effects for these intermediate outcomes almost no movement in terms of beliefs about politicians' efforts in the good or the bad news cases, nor about their perception of their incumbents' uh, honesty. Um, we do that at the same time. We do see that um, this passes a kind of basic manipulation check. Voters do seem to have seen the information, it just doesn't seem to have changed what they thought about politicians. What we're left with then is really just this residual explanation that the treatments weren't sufficiently strong, they weren't sort of uh, bombarded with enough SMS messages or enough flyers uh, for it to uh, sort of percolate into um, their evaluations. And so one way of seeing this is that campaigns are very noisy affairs. People are getting information from all angles, from media sources, uh, from canvases, from parties. Uh, so the marginal difference made by sort of one set of flyers uh, may be rather small. Yes? Um, maybe I missed this, but did you have an estimation of the quality of the opposition candidate or candidates? Um, yeah, so in a couple of studies, information was also provided about uh, the, uh, the challenges, though not in all cases. Interestingly, um, to the extent that I, I'd say that, to the extent that any study does find effects for this common arm treatment, mm -hmm. It is in the Uganda one case where, uh, which, it, which involved providing the most information about challenges. So that is a possibility, that uh, knowing more about the available alternatives is a sort of an important input into making information about challenges work. If you don't really know the alternatives, uh, then uh, maybe you just go with the devil you know. This is all the good news and bad news in your own performance, right? Uh, did you find any effect on the uh, sort of policy position? That would be the alternative explanation, which is, uh, I like my guy, he's corrupt, but he does what I want him to do. Right? Well, uh, he yep. delivers the policies that I prefer. Well, so, so a few things. So we didn't find it, so to clarify, we didn't find any effects on turnout either. And I think the, the, sort of the measures, the, the harmonized measures that would have come closest to what you're getting at are those on efforts and, uh, and integrity. We find sort of no movement. Uh, well, I, I thought one of your treatments was to reveal the policy position. So in one in one study, Uganda one case, they manipulated uh, information about the candidate's policy position, and in that case, yes, they do find movement in beliefs towards sort of converging on what the policy position is. And indeed, in that study, I think we get closest to finding sort of rejecting the null. Um, so in, that was sort of just one bubble of information. At least in the cases of public goods and malfeasance, we don't see any updating. Uh, towards what the information says is, is true about these politicians. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my issue about India. I'm sorry you didn't get the, the research done on India, but there is that book, uh, When Crime Pays, yeah. that tests the hypothesis of uh, why voters elect criminals. Yeah. And one of the, the issues would be maybe they don't know they are criminals. And the, the, the book comes to the conclusion that they all know they are criminals. And he's very effective, including for because he's a criminal. Yep. Right? So it creates effectiveness at the village mm -hmm. level. And whatever the policy you propose, you know, there are other ethnic and caste and issues that uh, affect. So yep. uh, I was very curious about that. Yeah, um, so that, it's a fascinating case. So the, the, the India case, there are actually, we have competing uh, studies. It's a very clear case. So the Vaishnav book, which says that people want to vote for criminal candidates because criminality is a signal of strength and competence. Um, however, it's sort of not tested in any kind of micro level way. Um, it's based on sort of observational survey data uh, and some uh, sort of uh, correlations uh, constituency, uh, across constituencies. Then we have another set of survey studies, um, sort of survey experiments, where people randomize the characteristics of politicians and they find that voters in those kind of candidate choice experiments heavily penalize criminals uh, in exactly the same case that uh, Vaishnav talks about, this uh, paper by Banerjee and Green. So again, we had this sort of conflicting evidence. This was an opportunity to uh, try and see what panned out when we delivered information more naturalistically. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the data from 
from that sense. The, another point is about Brazil. Well, we had the mayor from Brazil who spent a week at uh, GPS uh, last year. Last year? No, last earlier year. this year. No, last year. Um, and and he was high performing. He was elected, and when he ran for his re-election, he described that you know he there was a candidate who had coming from nowhere saying very weird things. We we are all familiar with that now. Uh, <laughs> and, and almost you know won and said I have to work really hard. And his hypothesis was interesting to test, which it was about. So it's a very middle class. Uh, city, so it's a state capital in island, in which most of the working class and the poor is outside of the island in in other small cities. So it's the same metropolitan area, but the city that he has, the capital, was sort of a more sort of a middle class. So that's but sort of a an income or, or class issue in, in that. Uh, in, in, in the I'm not sure if you're able to get income. Or, so it's, it's all middle class, it's more middle class or less middle class. Yeah, so uh, there is a heterogeneous effects analysis where we try and see whether poor or richer voters or middle income, vo uh, middle income voters are more receptive to information. Uh, we, see, we see really no differences uh, across mm -hmm. class groups. Um, so interesting hypothesis, but doesn't seem to pan out uh, in our data. Um, so, uh, the, uh, that said, so Craig mentioned that one of the ideas of the Medicator Initiative is that individual teams are given the opportunity to introduce an alternative arm. So this is something that's kind of proprietary to that team, which they can publish on, uh, and it, it can be sort of their innovative contribution uh, besides the replication dimension of this whole endeavor. Uh, so uh, we did have a couple of studies in which the information delivered was delivered not in a private fashion, so uh, handing over a flyer or showing an individual voter a video, but was rather disseminated in a, a public setting. Uh, so um, community sort of meetings or, or group uh, viewings of, of candidate debates in one case. And we do see sort of some evidence in these two cases uh, that the public dissemination of information does seem to have been more impactful. And one hypothesis is that uh, voters are not sort of happy, are not willing to be the first movers. Yes, I may learn that my politician is corrupt, but unless I know that other people know that, then I don't want to be the sort of the chump who moves first. However, if you deliver it in a public setting, then you might facilitate coordination between voters. There could be some either explicit or implicit agreement that we can coordinate around this dimension or upon politician's character uh, and vote on that basis. And we do see some evidence uh, in two studies uh, that this is indeed uh, what might have occurred. This would, uh, this would hopefully then be something which a future kind of aspiring Medicaid uh, team might take up and say, this is what we need to focus on next. We're going to move forward and in a coordinated fashion uh, put this to a kind of a hard, hard test as a common arm intervention. So, uh, what do we do to try and enhance the credibility of, of our uh, study uh, results? I want to touch on a, a couple of points here. So, there uh, are some really important things we did ex ante, uh, and these uh, centered on writing very detailed uh, pre analysis plans, both for the individual studies uh, and for the meta analysis. And a great deal of thought uh, went into uh, writing these plans. Uh, to guard against the sort of future selves uh, being tempted to, to p-hack uh, or to engage in uh, sort of hypothesizing after the results are known. Now, this said, not everything went smoothly. So there were some big things that went wrong uh, with the initiative as a whole. So Mexico, for sort of last minute budgetary reasons, I believe, uh, was unable to field a baseline survey with our uh, estimation for that study because we needed the priors. Uh, to try and see what was good and bad news, so we had to sort of work around that. Burkina Faso had a coup just as, about, just as the intervention was about to uh, go into the field, so there was a lot of sort of uh, work on the fly to uh, try and uh, rescue that study, which was ultimately done. Uh, voters turned out to have just no prize at all about a whole lot of these in things, this information. So about half of the voters, I think, in the full sample, we asked them what, uh, what, how corrupt do you think your politician is, how well did they perform in terms of public goods provision compared to a few municipalities across. Many just threw up their hands and said, I have absolutely no idea. Um, and we didn't really anticipate um, how, how many uh, people there would be in that category. Then, as I mentioned, the India study uh, failed altogether. A sort of uh, a bigger lesson uh, I definitely took away from this is that the pre-analysis plans, whilst very detailed, were written in words and not in statistical code. Now, that may not seem a problem if you, you know, write out the equations clearly and say what you're going to do. However, we ended up with an enormous number of ambiguities, uh, which we had to adjudicate after the, after the fact. 
Now, ideally, choices about what to do in these cases where there is ambiguity in the plan would be made in a results-blind way. Perhaps we'd send it out to you know, an independent committee who would say, well, what's the best thing to do without knowing what the results would be, consequence of those choices? In reality, the sort of process of discovering and presenting these results uh, was, was very different. Even knowing what that choice set uh, was, all of the decisions that could be made took some time, and we'd already known, sort of had some first cuts of the results by the time we were doing it. So we were left with a situation, how do we deal with these problems, given that we want to do this as well as possible? Now, one thing we did, uh, which I think is, uh, makes for a pretty persuasive analysis um, for the various papers and publications uh, we've made out of this, is to do a, a, a full specification curve analysis. So here what we did was to itemize all of the choices that we, discretionary choices that we made after the fact when we came to, to do the analysis. And then we sort of asked, well, if you tweaked one of these choices at a time uh, whilst conducting all of the other sort of combinations of choices, what impact would that have? Okay, so if you think of all of the choices and then all the possible combinations of choices, all the analyses that there could possibly be, uh, what do the results look like? What does the full distribution of results look like under all of those possible choices? Now, as you can imagine, I forget exactly how many choices there are here, but it's something like 15 to 20. Um, if you uh, multiply all those together, you end up with uh, many thousands of models. Each of the dashes on uh, this plot represents the uh, estimated uh, effect uh, on vote for the incumbents, I think it's for bad news, oh sorry, good news, um, the estimated effect, and those marked in black are those where we reject the null, those which uh, we reject at the 5% uh, confidence level. And uh, the sort of takeaway from this is, well, yes, we made a lot of sort of post hoc choices, but it would have been a very unusual thing uh, to actually observe uh, a positive, a, a significant effect. Uh, you would have, it's a relatively few combination of choices which would have yielded that, suggesting that the null is really uh, quite robust. So, uh, another sort of, I think, uh, more uh, innovative thing we did here was to say, well, we made all these choices, there are going to be readers who come along with their own preferences for how a good analysis of an experiment should be conducted. Uh, does any, what, would be some, what would be some major choices you might want to make as an analyst of an experiment? What would be some big sort of points of contention in these analyses? Thoughts? Yeah, so should you control the background characteristics of respondents? Lots of people would say no. We randomize, they're going to be the same in expectation, no need to do that. Other people say, well, it's, we're, going to, we're going to improve precision. So that might be a choice that we commonly make as, as analysts about which reasonable disagreement uh, exists. So what we did was to set up a, uh, a small computer program. Um, this is uh, possible using the R programming language, language in a, um, a feature called uh, Shiny Apps. And this is, uh, allows us to develop a flexible online interface where non-expert re readers can uh, conduct their own analysis uh, in any way that they want to do, uh, making any of the choices that we made ourselves. Now it turns out that making this app is not at all difficult, and the robustness uh, to these choices can be made at the click of a button, and uh, one thought I had sort of writing these slides is this might spell the end to 100 page appendices in papers where we try and present all of the, re all of the reasonable possible alternative analyses. Well, here we might just be able to have one URL link footnotes. Let me just show you um, uh, what this looks like um, for the Medicated One Shiny app. So uh, this uh, is hosted on the uh, EGAT website. Here um, we have uh, one analysis. So we've selected this option for a meta-analysis of all of the studies. Um, and uh, here is just the plot um, of the effect and the associated confidence intervals. You'll see a very precise knob. Now let's say a, a very strange reviewer came along and said, you shouldn't be controlling for education in trying to improve the precision of your estimates, um, so I'd like you to drop that. Well, we can just unclick that uh, and automatically uh, this will update. Now we might say that in one of the studies there was debate over whether or not we should include a particular set of politicians uh, about whom outcomes are being collected. We can change that, see whether the result changes. In this case it doesn't, but perhaps in other analyses it might. So we are sort of advocating uh, use of this tool as a good way to try and uh, amplify sort of the robustness of empirical studies uh, coming out. Um, this is something, uh, if you're doing empirical work, uh, I'd encourage you to explore yourself. Uh, you can allow users of this app to download individually tailored data sets um, based on choices that you want to make uh, inside the app. 
Uh, you can make it produce PDF outputs of the different analyses if you want uh, somebody else to print them off. You can toggle between graphical or tabular displays of the data and the analysis. It can be great for teaching statistics, uh, as you can show students uh, how things change. It's free, it works on smartphones, and there are many, uh, there are galleries of examples and templates uh, which are freely available, and so you're not having to reinvent the, the wheel uh, each time. So this is, uh, I really think uh, this is worth, something worth checking out. Um, uh, it's sort of a great um, feature of what we ended up doing uh, with our analysis. Okay, um, how are we doing on time? Yeah, I'm going to spend five minutes. So I want to finish with uh, a follow-up experiment we did, where we wanted to answer this question. Does Medicator-type evidence help us to generalize and to persuade people uh, about the effects of an intervention? So uh, for all that we did, this is still a convenient sample of cases. We didn't randomly select cases, uh, select cases say, from countries or regions. Uh, we didn't target um, cases on, on kind of theoretically interesting parameters. So this does open up the uh, question, even given this, is external validity possible? Does this help with external validity? Now we treat this as an empirical question, and what we tried to do was to find out whether exposure to these results in fact <coughs> helps uh, people, in particular policymakers, to make better out-of-sample predictions, out-of-sample guesses about how a study will turn out elsewhere. As a sort of secondary question, we wanted to ask, can coordinated research be more persuasive than the results taken from individual standalone <coughs> studies. What we did was to uh, bring together a, a group of around 50 policymakers uh, at the uh, George Washington University in Washington DC, in what we were what, what we um, sort of build as an evidence summit summit to disseminate the results uh, of these six studies, which had previously been embargoed. And uh, the sort of key part of this was that we presented all of the attendees with the backgrounds, designs to all of the studies, the questions that was being asked, everything that was common to the studies, but we kept the results quiet until this afternoon session. What we then did was expose participants to four different types of presentations with different sort of bundles, different types of um, uh, results. So uh, these came in four categories. They were, everybody was exposed to a single Medicaid study, a meta-analysis of five out of the six Medicaid studies, a placebo condition, uh, and the results of an outside study which showed large significant effects but addressed the same uh, substantive research question. And as I mentioned, so five out of six, in the uh, a meta-analysis of five out of the six studies, that meant there was one left over which was an unseen study, and the participants would have to try and guess the results of that unseen study as they went through the rooms and went through these different um, pre types of presentation. So for example, one uh, subject might have been assigned to see Uganda 1 results in round 1, then a placebo presentation in round 2, a meta-analysis that didn't have the Brazil study in round 3, and then an external study, uh, one of the Faraz and Fanon paper, uh, in round 4. After each of these rounds and a baseline, they would try and make a guess about the Brazil study. And we asked them a series of questions. What do you think was the estimated result in this study for vote choice and for turnout in the bad news case? And what are your beliefs about um, the true effect of the intervention in that context? And how much money would you allocate to voter information uh, interventions uh, based on what you've just uh, been exposed to? Okay, we, it turns out that um, people's priors about this information was really quite different to yours in this room. Uh, most people thought the information would have some effect, a modest, but nevertheless, uh, a non-null effect uh, on uh, how voters um, behave. So what I'm going to do is just to show you uh, quickly uh, how people updated over the course of the uh, whole uh, experience, the sort of full collection of results, uh, and then uh, the experimental uh, estimation of exposure to different types of presentations. So here we're just going to say, well, let's look at before, after comparisons. They saw these uh, presentations over the course of about two hours. What did their beliefs and their predictions look like at baseline compared to endpoints? This is not an experimental comparison. Uh, this is just uh, before, after. So what we see is, um, I'm just going to cycle through these, we see in uh, uh, columns one and three, the people turned out to make much more pr uh, accurate predictions uh, about the effects in the unseen study. Now, you'll know that all of the studies show null results, so the question here really is how quickly did they converge on that null? How quickly did they come to understand that this, interve this intervention really wasn't working anywhere? Well, they did figure that out um, comparing before and after. Now, these other two um, columns are quite interesting. 
we found that their confidence in the efficacy of the interventions in the particular context went down by a statistically significant amount. And we also found that the amount of money that they were willing to uh, give to these types of interventions compared to two other democracy-promoting interventions also dropped uh, by a statistically significant amount. So people, after seeing this information, did seem to be somewhat persuaded, and they did turn out to make better predictions about how this intervention might play out elsewhere. So that seems to be uh, uh, some sort of uh, uh, confirmation of the effectiveness of this, um, this type of research product. Last, uh, I want to just uh, highlight here a couple of the experimental comparisons where we can ask, well, what's the effect of being exposed to a meta-analysis of five out of the six studies compared to a placebo or compared to, say, just a single study? And this is a test, in a way, of the, the Medicator idea. Well, it turns out that seeing a meta-analysis uh, really had a very big effect on how people allocated money, uh, certainly compared to the effects of seeing uh, a single study instead of nothing, which had no effect. So if you're thinking about how to persuade a policymaker and you're going to plan a research product, show them six studies showing the same thing rather than a single study showing that. That would seem, at least in this data, uh, to uh, cause them to shift uh, their allocations uh, rather substantially. Interestingly, we do see that uh, the uh, meta-analysis uh, versus nothing uh, did uh, improve some predictions, so are those on turnout, though less so sort of uh, their predictions about vote choice. Uh, somewhat disappointingly, uh, seeing a meta-analysis instead of a single study didn't cause, them, didn't cause more accurate predictions uh, compared uh, to uh, uh, when we think about uh, just uh, rejecting the null of no effect. So uh, science then that it shifts beliefs, so it's quite persuasive evidence uh, when it comes to thinking about programming in future. Uh, it doesn't turn out to be quite as effective uh, when uh, trying to get people to make more accurate predictions in out of sample cases. Let me uh, wrap up and turn over to Claire. What have we learned? Informational interventions about candidates' performance seem to have little effect on voting behavior. So at least as conventionally practiced by a number of uh, NGOs and governments uh, uh, after whom uh, these interventions were modeled. The conclusions we're drawing here are, we think, uh, from these integrated studies are more robust, more credible, and more externally valid than we've seen uh, compared to results from single studies. I showed you some of the ways in which we went to great lengths uh, to ensure analytical transparency, and we'd sort of urge others to follow in uh, some of these footsteps. And then, as Craig mentioned, we have uh, four more of these uh, in the works on taxation, natural resource governance, community policing. There's a new one being developed on political participation in non-democratic regimes. But the sort of the decentralized nature of the Medicator is such that if you wanted to do one and you had the sort of uh, inclination to do so, this is something you could pull together with uh, other research teams and it can be a sort of a bottom-up approach to producing cumulative research. So thank you very much, and I'll hand over to Claire. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Garrett. Um, uh, so thanks for being here, guys. Um, so what I want to talk about is a view from below. So this is uh, a little bit of my perspective as the, one of the PIs on the Benin team, and these were my co-PIs uh, who aren't here today. Uh, and I'm going to focus really just on some of the, I'm not going to talk at all about the results, you, you can actually, most of the stuff is published, you can, you can read about it, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the dynamics and some of the challenges and the trade-offs that we had to face, um, given um, the introduction that Craig uh, provided. Um, so I want to start by saying that uh, we got this grant in 2014, and this was a golden opportunity for me and for most of us. First of all, it was money, it was my first mm. external grant. Right? So I'm a junior faculty, I'm on the tenure track, it's my first time I get money, not from UCSD. Um, it was a golden opportunity because it was built-in mentoring and advising from the beginning. Where we had this Politburo, what Garrett calls the Politburo of uh, pretty senior scholars, uh, pretty established names in the field, and we were going to get feedback from them uh, from beginning to end. And we knew there was going to be publications from this. And we knew there was going to be more than one publication. There was, going to, at the very least, going to be an integrated publication. There was probably going to be a book. And then there was going to be our individual papers. And so this was really exciting when we first, um, when we first got this. It was perfect for us as junior faculty on the tenure track. It was our next big project, which is whether the university wants to see you when they evaluate you for tenure after your dissertation. Um, and most of the teams were actually very heavily junior. They were junior faculty, some of them were grad students. There was, it was a strong, a heavy balance towards um, um, scholars who really saw that, were likely to see this as a golden opportunity. 
But the question is, do the incentives align? And um, here, what I want to do is really um, make really make make uh, obvious the contrast between what the PIs prioritize, what the Politburo prioritizes, which is coordination, standardization. We need all the studies to be standardized, to be similar. Otherwise, we can't do a meta-analysis. Uh, versus what the individual teams wanted, which was publications and what that means. <laughs> you want to publish, you need to be novel, you need to be the first to do this, right? And so these are very much the, 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 the kind of difficult incentives that Craig was talking about at the beginning. And it wasn't completely resolved with this Medicare. And so I want to talk about this in, in terms of a series of trade-offs that we face. The coordination relevance trade-off, the coordination novelty trade-off, and the coordination ethics trade-off. So what's the coordination relevance trade-off? So for the Medicare to work, you need coordination. Um, as you saw from Gareth's presentation, we needed to have um, a standardized set of a standardized set of interventions, a standardized way of measuring outcomes. Um, and we were able to really converge on this uh, after a lot of meetings and a lot of discussion. Um, so we converged on some pretty important decisions. We converged on what the content of the information provided would be in terms of um, uh, the fact that it would be performance information, the fact that it would be relative to people's priors, the fact that it would be relative to a local benchmark, so, so comparing politicians to, their, um, to other politicians in the locality. Um, and, and we converge on, on how to measure uh, which outcomes we would measure and, and how we would measure them. But then the question is, what if the relevant performance information, and, and I got some of your questions reflect this question, this problem. What if the relevant performance information differs across context? What if the kind of information that, um, that is relevant to voters in Benin is really, really different from the kind of information that is relevant to voters in Mexico or in India, right? And to some extent, there was, as you saw, there was room for, for variation. Uh, in India, they gave information about criminal background. In Benin, we gave information about legislative performance. Uh, in terms of how, um, how active legislators were in the National Assembly. In um, Brazil, it was about corruption. The first to write up papers, we didn't really have a first mover advantage because we had to have the results embargoed for a while. We didn't want knowledge of our results to contaminate future studies, so the results were embargoed. Um, and then we, held off a we had to hold off on individual publications for a little while for good reason. Um, first, because we were looking for um, possibilities for a set of joint publications, so we wanted to see if that would pan out. And also because we needed to go through the third party replication, and so that also delayed us. Um, so it did delay, um, it delayed our, our, our publication hopes by a little bit. It wasn't, I mean, at the end of the day, we were able to publish and it went well. But it, that, was a, that was a bit of a, a, a challenge and, and a tension at the time. Um, the third uh, trade-off is a coordination ethics trade-off, and here um, the question is what, the inter what is appropriate or what makes sense or what is maybe uncontroversial in one context may be very controversial in another context. Uh, so providing information about politician performance uh, may be just fine in Benin, but not at all in India. And as a matter of fact, it turned out to not be okay, right? The, the, India, the India city had to... Um, um, had to, we had to cut the, cut the cord on that. Um, so, so this is the example I just gave you. And here I have to say that actually I think that being a part of the Medicata study was a, uh, um, a, a really good thing in this regard. That the Medicata dealt with this, the group dealt with this really well. Uh, we had a lot of conversations about ethics throughout the entire period. Um, I don't know if you guys know, or remember this kind of debacle that happened in 2015, but right, right as we were going into the field, there was this kind of ethical controversy that, that blew up with the Stanford Dartmouth um, uh, experiment in the US. We'll continue to uh, get better as we learn from, uh, from the challenges that we have, that we faced. So, thank you. All right, so we have time for some questions from the floor. I have a question. Do you guys want to go ahead and take a seat? Yeah, sure. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I, I think the, the question that kept coming back to my mind and described the experiment, which is quite interesting, is what is different 
in the information you provide from an actual campaign information that the opposition candidate is providing the public to shift the vote? Talk about the beginning, uh, <laughs> but uh, so 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 um, I think there probably were many other messages that were going around at the same time. So I think your intuition is correct that there is there's a lot of, of um, interventions going on at the same time. We just happen to be in control of one of them. Uh, the information that we provided was information that was actually really hard to get. It was supposed to be public, but it was really hard to get. We had to go to the national assembly. We had to collect all this data to make it um, to, to make it systematic, easy to read, easy to access. We went into the villages. We showed it to, to the villagers. So it's actually quite uh, labor intensive, right? We 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 made the information much more accessible um, to people. This not to say that the opposition wasn't doing the same thing, but it, it's it's a lot of work, a lot of resources. So the, the uh, I think. One way to rephrase is that, well, maybe the opposition is not running a very good campaign because there's hard work to do that they are not doing. Well, it may be that, you know, there could be trust deficits as well, right? So you may, as a voter, you may discount information which is delivered by politicians because you know they have an incentive to exaggerate um, or, to, or to lie. Um, in these sort of informational campaigns, we're trying to deliver from an objective source is it something we measure at baseline? How uh, credible do you think the source of this information uh, would be uh, in the future? Um, and we find that even sort of among those voters who say this is a very credible source, when they get the information, it doesn't doesn't change how they vote. But it's also important. I mean, a, a, a one important piece of information is that the information that you gave did not match the priors in many, many, many cases, right? So there is a there is an observational difference. Yes, the story that you're telling is consistent with the non-result, but it would if, if the story that you're telling is the whole story, then it really should have been the case that there was not daylight between what they already thought was the case and what was what was disseminated as part of the studies. And that is definitely not the case. There were lots and lots and lots of cases where there were very large differences between the priors and what was conveyed. It seems to be much more, as, as was said by both of them, that it was that that, that you know, I, I'm, I'm invested in the way that I feel about the politician that I support, and then that feeling is much more difficult uh, to nudge than, than was conceptualized at the time the program was developed. On the Medicare framework in general, um, you guys were lucky. You got no results across the board in every single case, and then in the minute analysis. What would you have been able to conclude if three of the six had small marginal effects, right? Is it, how do you interpret that in that case? Even if you got the overall knowledge in the case of the meta-analysis, it worked here and it didn't work there, right? But it's not exactly the same thing, right? So we don't know whether it's the context, we don't know whether it's the message that's delivered or how it's delivered, whatever, right? We're left with uh, very hard to interpret results in a more mixed case. So uh, let me push you a little bit and say, what would you have done or what could you have concluded if you weren't so lucky and found a null across the board? Um, it's an excellent question. Um, the, uh, so I think one thing that's important here is, so what, what is the effective end, you might ask? Uh, of this uh, sort of study, uh, of this collection of studies, and it, it's six or maybe seven if we completed the India study. So, what can you end up doing with that? Um, well, one thing you could do, and which was done, was to specify in advance uh, just a very few number of hypotheses about study level heterogeneity. Now, you're not going to be able to do a statistical test of this to try and discern it, but if you make two or three predictions that we should see effects in these three places or in this manner and not in these three places, and that turns out to be the case. That could be somewhat convincing evidence for, uh, for whatever. Yeah, but you didn't start with a theory that somehow a video screen was going to be more persuasive than a flyer. No, but how right. do we found? So, how, I mean, where does that come from? This is just made up on the fly in this case, right? Had we found that uh, the two studies which used videos uh, showed large effects and the four others didn't, that would be suggestive that videos. Right, but that's not uh, 
uh, it's not regenerative, but it would, it's sort of material which you could take forward and say, well, that's something that deserves to be tested more rigorously. Then there may be individual level heterogeneity, which you might be able to leverage, depending on the theory you wanted to test within the studies, which might contribute to a broader sort of understanding of the, of the things uh, which are going on. But, but it, it, is, it is tricky, yes. And uh, we'd seen considerable heterogeneity, it would have been a much more difficult sort of uh, thing we had to sell, but a much more interesting one as well. Okay. Yes, so, just to follow up a little bit, I mean, most of the forms of variation in treatment effects that you would be interested in uh, would have variation that is observable below the national level. That's so what, what Gareth was saying. So if it's about competitiveness or if it's about, right, so, so even, even things that are fairly systemic features of an electoral context, there's going to be a lot of variation within any given country. Uh, and so, so, I mean, I think, it, as Gareth was saying, the, 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 the sources of heterogeneity that we're just totally over-identified on are, are those ones that are truly national level. Um, but we were very hopeful that we would be able to confirm that if you know, these two studies are significant and the others aren't, that there is variation within the other studies, right? There's heterogeneity within the other studies that if, for example, you were trying to reweight those studies to be representative of the ones that were significant, that you would get results that look like those other studies. So you're, you're framing this as a hopeless uh, search for heterogeneity by thinking about it as, as you know, seven national level studies, and I agree with you that's the case. I think if you look at the actual dimensions of heterogeneity that were pre-specified, the large majority of them are sub-national, and there I think there's a lot of hope to be able to address this one. This might be irrelevant, but so this set of experiments is uh, giving information uh, one shot. Right, but do we see any follow-ups? Um, say NGOs uh, trying to to build up some institutions and providing more correct information, or as you were saying that you know when people learn this, people would would, would want to decrease their their funding to those institutions. But you know this is a one-shot information uh, uh, experiment, and it's hard to say about the long-run information channel. Or do we see any local uh, media changes or any policy discussions about this? Can I just make sort of one sort of important sort of clarification in the overall framing of these results? The takeaway here is not that information doesn't matter for political accountability. It's that these particular types of voter information campaigns, which are fairly widely used by NGOs, um, by various government agencies in some places, um, these, these types of information campaigns uh, don't seem to be that effective. So if NGOs, if NGOs are investing money in this, they should probably think about doing something else or bolstering them uh, with, with other kinds of, of treatments uh, because they don't seem to be working uh, in, this, in this way. So the conclusion here is not take away all money from, uh, from efforts to provide better information. It's sort of uh, think a bit harder uh, about how difficult it is to actually get uh, voters to uh, change their beliefs and to change their beliefs. Claire, I want to know how many of those publications came before you got tenure and how many <laughs> <laughs> All after them. No. 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 One, one critical one came before. Okay. I feel a little bit better. It might be my most, my highest ranked publication. Okay. <laughs> I, I do want to say, just, uh, just as a follow-up on what Gareth was saying, that I mean, part of the motivation is that there is a ton of money being poured into these kinds of interventions, right? Think about, about USAID, right? So, you guys might have, your priors might have been, well, no, this isn't going to work. But you're going to provide this kind of standardized information. It's not going to work. Well, that's what we're doing uh, in many developing democracies, and that's where we're sending money. So, I think it is actually really valuable information to know that this type of campaign. May not be optimal. So an equivalent might be to think about the sort of the microfinance uh, equivalent, right? So you know, there was a, a set of six studies which showed that microfinance was not nearly as effective as we thought it was. The conclusion drawn from that shouldn't be that you know credit and banking are as important for economic development. It's just that this particular form that they take uh, is not may not be as effective as we thought. 